All right. I've got two o'clock right now. So let me take this opportunity to welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Alexander. I'm your host, MC, and Chief Cat Herder for today. I'm really glad everyone here can make it for this May 5th, our first May Future Trends Forum. Just to remind you, or introduce this fact to you, that uh, the Future Trends Forum is an offshoot of the Future Trends in Technology and Education Research Project. Uh, that's a monthly report. It's a combination of trends analysis and horizon scanning. In fact, the most recent report just came out this morning. So if you don't know FTTE, uh, go to that link there, FTTE.us, um, and uh, sign up and grab another, grab the most recent two months reports. Uh, this comes out of that, where we take a look at current developments in order to better understand the future of education. Next slide. I'd like to thank two different uh, entities for helping make this possible. First, I'd like to thank NizerNet from New York State, uh, because they've been very generous sponsors for FTT. And I'd also like to thank Shindig, because as you can see here, Shindig is making this possible. Both the technology that you can see in front of you, which I'll introduce you to again in just a minute, but also their people who do a terrific job of supporting us. So thank you to Shindig for making all this possible. In fact, since we're talking about Shindig, let me just introduce this technology to you or remind, remind you of how it works. Um, right now, you are looking at the Shindig space. On the top half of the screen, where I am, you can see two images. Uh, this is called the stage. And this is usually where people who are discussing things will be. Right now, there's a little PowerPoint stack. Don't worry, that'll go away until the very end. Most of this is people talking. On the bottom half, where the rest of you guys are, you can see a bunch of different icons or avatars, each one of those representing a different login, usually a different person. You can see a picture of them if they have a photo or a video feed, or just a, a drawing uh, if they are there but have, don't have their camera turned on. Those are organized into rooms. And if you click on the bottom left of the screen, you can see links to other rooms, and you can see many other people who are here. Now, how to participate and interact? There are a few different ways. First, like a webinar, you can hear us and see us right now and soak a conversation, which is great. If you'd like to contribute, if you'd like to push back or ask questions, there are actually four different ways of doing that. First, look at the bottom right of the screen. You can see two orange dots. One of them has a hand and the word raise on it. This is a way for raising your hand. If you click that, that tells the Shindig staff and myself that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. When the time is right, we'll then put you up on stage so you can use your mic and your camera and talk to us, which is great. If, on the other hand, you don't have the mic and camera turned on or feel like it, or if you prefer text, click that Ask button right next to it. That's basically kind of super chat, and that sends a question to me and to the Shindig team, and then I can read that out loud for you. Now, a third way is you can communicate by chat. If you haven't done this before, take your cursor and mouse over yourself, your little picture of yourself. You should get four or five different boxes. They say mute, settings, lock, enlarge, and one of them will say I am chat. If you click that, they'll take you to the chat box for the room you're in, and you'll see all kinds of people who are there and so you can click my room and chat with people who are there or click individuals if you want to speak privately to them. And the fourth way is if you would like to be able to use Twitter, people often do in our uh, future transform, please feel free to just make sure that you use the hashtag FTTE so that we can catch it. So I'll be monitoring all four of those channels as we go but in the meantime let me introduce the most important part, our guest. So, our next slide here has a quick introduction. Our guest is Deanna Markham, and she is the first returned guest in the history of Future Transform. Uh, she is currently the Managing Director of Ithaca SNR. And if you don't know that operation, it's a terrific, terrific research and consulting outfit in New York. They publish wonderful reports, one of which we'll be discussing today. There's a link there. Deanna, in her past, has been an associate librarian for library services for the Library of Congress. She's been awarded the prestigious Melville Dewey Award. She was one of the co-founders of the Council of Library Information Resources. And she 
He's an incredibly accomplished and brilliant, a very Hello, powerful Ryan. and brilliant Hello, thinker. Everyone. And I'm really glad to have her back on the forum. Oh, it's really good to see you. And to all of those who were in our first effort that uh, where I had technical problems, thanks for rejoining. It's really nice. Thanks. Oh, we're really glad you could make it. Um, one of the things that we'd like to talk about today, there are two main areas to, to discuss which are deeply intertwined. One is the future of libraries. So in the future transform, we take a look at current trends involving technology and education, and we've been slicing that in different ways. We've been looking at everything from finance to investment to specific technologies. But last time that we did, Deanna, we started talking about that, and I'd like to continue with that. And to get you thinking about the future of libraries, or to give you a way in, because I know you have so many ideas about that, let me ask, in 2016, have there been any developments, uh, anything in terms of policy or libraries, technology, or anything that you've seen, which really suggests to you something powerful about the future for libraries? Anything recent that we should pay attention to? Yeah. That's such an interesting question, Brian. Uh, there are a couple of things that I've been really interested in, and, and they are quite different, but let me just use them as examples. Um, early in the year, we learned that Lyricis and Duraspace had announced the, uh, an intention to merge. And they were looking at ways that their two organizations could be more effective by coming together. And on the face of it, they seem to be really dissimilar. Um, but you look at um, the capacities that each organization brings, and it seems to me that um, that that's a trend worth watching. I don't know where that's going to go. Um, I don't even know where it stands right now. But it seems to me that as libraries are looking for more um, for better and more effective ways to bring services and resources to their users, trying to find those synergies instead of having to go to lots of organizations to see if they can bring their skills together and create a, a broader platform for delivering services. That, that seems really important to me. Can, can you just say a word about um, uh, what Lyricis and Space are for people in the audience who might not know them? Um, yeah, Lyricis is a, um, let's see, how, how do I describe it? It's a network or it's a membership organization. It uh, provides bibliographic services, preservation services, storage services. You know, it it's an offshoot of the old OCLC networks that were created probably in the late 1970s. Um, but it it started as a way to provide bibliographic services to a region. It's now a national organization. Um, Solonet and Palinet combined earlier on and, and to become Lyricis, and now it's providing all these things. Um, mm. Duraspace mm. is um, is really a technology organization. It was created to provide technological solutions to libraries that are interested in preserving digital content and um, and storing digital content, and it's provided technical solutions to a relatively smaller number of libraries. So this technology group and a network group have are at least in the process of seeing if they can combine their capabilities to provide different kinds of services to their members. So that seems really interesting to me. Um, That's second, beautifully said. I was wow. um, I was at the Center for Research Libraries meeting earlier, um, I guess two weeks ago, and I talked about preservation. The focus of the meeting was preservation, and I talked about the history of our national efforts to consider preservation as a library community. And it was, um, I think I was viewed as a 
kind of pessimist because I recounted a lot of, I would say, unsuccessful efforts to think about preservation as an entire community. But what encouraged me about that meeting very much is that uh, the people in who were participating in the forum started thinking very uh, creatively about what each of us can do to ensure that we're we're at least doing our part to preserve the cultural and intellectual record, and that discussion seems more and more important to me. I think we have a lot of empirical evidence that a, a centralized national plan is never going to work in this country, or at least not, not in my lifetime. But we're beginning to think about how our mm. individual mm. efforts can be brought together synergistically to add up to something important. So I, I felt really happy about that. Um, now there's a you know there are many other things that we could say about the future of libraries, but those are two things that have happened just recently that I find encouraging, and I, I find them encouraging because people are beginning to think about these issues in new ways, and I would say um, most importantly, they're thinking about them in a networked way, they're beginning to see each library as part of the one of the nodes in the great network of libraries that we have in this country. So on the one hand, we've got the, we have the merger of a technology and a library group mm -hmm. suggesting that we may be seeing a wave of such combinations. On the other hand, we're seeing a rising discussion about how best to preserve the cultural record. Why do you why do you think that the centralized operation won't do it in in, in the U.S.? Do we just have too diverse a um, uh, an academic structure? Um, is there just no strong central player that can do the job? Are we just uh, uh, kind of know, nation I that can should, elect Donald Trump can't do this? <laughs> I should uh, please go to our website uh, uh, sr.ithaca.org. And look, I, my, I posted my paper there on uh, preservation efforts, and I go into some detail as to why I think. Um, oh, great! That but I, I can be uh, quick and maybe a little humorous. I say what we've learned thus far is that um, self-appointed groups annoy others. <laughs> Used to be one of the problems. Um, we, I count several attempts that the, <laughs> several announcements that the Library of Congress made beginning in 1976 when um, the Library of Congress announced that it was going to, to launch a national preservation program. And it announced it again later and then announced it again later. And of course, in each case, that didn't actually work. And um, starting with uh, then librarian Daniel Borson, who said, you know, due to administrative, uh, or administrative, organizational, and fiscal problems, um, this did not work as <laughs> as we thought it might. Um, but I made a special plea in my paper to at least. As, as a new librarian of Congress is about to be appointed, we hope, um, maybe there is another opportunity uh -huh. for at least raising that issue in the library community. You know, is the Library of Congress willing to play some kind of at least coordinating role, um, maybe helping all of us focus our efforts in a way? Short of that, are there um, are some of the network solutions that we're using for other problems? Can we begin to think about such a network offering an aggregated solution so that every every individual effort counts for something? And I don't know exactly how that would work. I even recommend at the end of the paper that we just uh, that we have some kind of election of a national 
coordinating committee from different organizations so that it's not a self-appointed group, but a, an elected body of some kind who would say, uh -huh. Uh -huh. we're going to take responsibility for at least trying to, to describe the scope of the problem and giving you ways to participate in it. So I'm I'm not sure exactly how that would work. I I don't um, I offer some of the the big ideas and don't have the, I didn't have the problem of figuring out all the logistics. But I I really think it's important because we're going to lose a generation of digital content if if we mm. don't uh, have mm -hmm. some kind of plan in place. Uh, I think that's a, some have called this the digital dark age, I believe, you know, right. the chance of losing access to all these different records and documents. Right. No, that's a huge issue. Um, so these are, these are two powerful trends that you, that you can see. I, by the way, um, does your, is your paper the one that begins by talking about the Austro-Gothic uh, critic right. Cassiodorus? <laughs> I made my day. That made, I just put that in Twitter and put it in the chat box. That's awesome. If you guys haven't had a chance to read that, <laughs> that will really be in the blog post about this issue. As well. <laughs> yeah, that's fabulous. Oh, it is. It is. Well, um, you know, thinking about this, <clears throat> let me ask if um, first, everyone, all the participants, um, if you have any thoughts about these two trends. Again, this is the question of mergers uh, of greater synthesis of library and information organizations. And the second is this growing need to uh, do digital preservation in a better way, especially in networked and distributed fashion. Um, if you have a question or comment about that, um, if you're in my chat room, toss it in the chat box. If you're not, uh, click the ask button or the raise hand button uh, so you can speak. In the meantime, let me just press on a little bit further. Um, Deanna, that sounds like uh, a very, very different set of questions from what we were describing in March when we first met. We were talking about the transformation of library services. Um, I mean, what you just described are in many ways traditional or classic library services, preservation of the record, uh, and then the digital services rendering access to, to content. Have you had any thoughts about new services that you see libraries offering, say, in the next 10 years? Right. Well, there are, there are so many. I, I was going to say I should probably go back for the benefit of those who didn't join us the first time, in which I did focus on the need for new library services. And I talked quite a bit about um, what I see as the success of public libraries in becoming um, information hubs for their communities and really thinking about the, the specialized needs of their communities and providing services to meet those needs. And my hope for academic and research libraries is that they can begin to do something that's more like that and becoming the, the hubs uh, for their communities. And I think um, there are many opportunities to provide new services for faculty and students. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of academic libraries struggling with ways to provide uh, data management services, um, geospatial services, uh -huh. visualization uh -huh. services, those kinds of things that will uh -huh. help faculty uh -huh. with their research and teaching. Those are incredibly important. But on the student side, um, I was thinking about this in the context of our recent faculty survey, and one of the most interesting findings of the faculty survey that was released just a, a few weeks ago is that there is a, a much greater need, according to teaching faculty, to have librarians participate in um, improving the, the information skills of their students. They're, they're concerned that their students really don't know how to find information resources. And um, even three years ago, 
um, most faculty who said my students don't have the skills they need considered the faculty the responsible party for helping with that. But in this more recent survey, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the role of the library. And there were a couple of statistics that I found really interesting, Brian, and I, and I thought this might be a way to think about some of the services we could provide. Um, in, in asking a question about the extent to which faculty inform librarians about what they've included in their syllabi for their courses, only 30% said they inform the librarians about the, the, their course content. And yet, um, <laughs> no, 67% of them agreed strongly that improving uh, the research skills of their students is an important educational goal for their courses and over 50 percent thought that the library played a really important role in that. Um, it's also interesting that some 75 percent of the teaching faculty said when they are looking for um, resources for their courses they give the strongest preference to openly available resources. So it seems really? to me that what, yes, so one of the things that I'm really interested in is how do we think then about how to connect the web resources with the students, help the faculty um, make that connection, and it's going to require a much stronger partnership between faculty and librarians and building those relationships in such a way that we're all responsible for improving student outcomes, uh, making sure that students stay in school, complete their coursework, graduate, the kinds of things that, that uh, higher education institutions are really worried about. It seems to me that libraries can play an incredibly important role. And figuring out a way to do that that feels like a partnership for both the faculty and the librarians, I think, is key. Um, I don't think we, we're going to be effective in just offering our you know, hour-long information literacy workshop uh, for anyone who wants to come. We really have to think about how to be partners in that um, educational experience. And that, I think, is, is a big challenge, but also where we can be providing services that the universities and colleges really care about. And we're helping them achieve their mission. So I, uh, that's the other trend that I'm hoping for. I think there's a lot of work to be done there that would be really helpful. I like the way that uh, that most recent point about libraries helping faculty and students with the completion and uh, retention and the nicely parallels the way that universities and colleges are spending more time on that very agenda. Um, right. I've got a follow up question, but let me hang on to it for a sec because uh, Michael Berman uh, from California State University campus has a question. Um, let's see, uh, why don't we bring Michael up on stage? Kick me out of the way. Okay. Hi, Deanna. How are you? Hello, Michael. How are you doing? Great. Um, this kind of goes back to what you were talking earlier about preservation and about um, collaboration to preserve knowledge and digital knowledge. It seems like there's so much in the current state of, of copyright law, at least in the United States, that really adds an extra level of complexity and difficulty to that. And I wonder if, if, if you're seeing anything blowing in the political winds that would start to change that so that we can start to have a national conversation about not just about protecting the intellectual properties of uh, individual creators and publishing companies, but about how, how um, what's appropriate to preserve it over time so that um, we can, you know, and I, and I wonder if maybe if the Google uh, decision gives us any hope that the, the winds might be shifting in that direction. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. Oh, it's such an interesting. You're absolutely right. I, th I think that is, you know that's one of the biggest barriers uh, to being able to preserve all that we need to preserve. Although, uh, you know, if you read the copyright law closely, we have 
um, we have the right to preserve material, even if it's in copyright. We don't have the right to display it <laughs> necessarily, but um, we do have the right to preserve it. Uh, one of the of course, things you, that I, I'm sorry. If you preserve it, if you preserve it, but I can't access it, your preservation doesn't doesn't help me as much as it I might. Know. I, although. Um, I, do, I just wanted to make that clarification in terms of what the, the law is. I agree. Without access, preservation doesn't mean much. Um, we have to be able to preserve materials so that we can make them accessible. As you probably know, there is a, there is a desire on the part of the Copyright Office that's within the Library of Congress to um, to move out of the Library of Congress and be a separate agency. And it seems to me that the most important issue facing the new Librarian of Congress is um, trying to resolve this copyright issue. It is, for me, it is critically important that the Copyright Office remain in the Library of Congress purview so that decisions that are made about copyright rulings are looked at from the library's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, I fear that that would be lost if, uh, if that were outside the, the Library of Congress. I know that there are, uh, you know, there are lots of people who are working on this. There are many people who are anxious to revisit some of the copyright laws and to uh, bring the kind of of energy and intelligence to preservation as a way to increase access rather than looking at these things through privacy, security, you know, the, the kinds of things that intellectual content holders might be more interested in. Um, that's just a really important national policy agenda. And I, I, I wish I had some great answer. I don't. It's just one of the things I follow very closely. We all have to be really concerned about it. And we have to speak out about these things because um, there are lots of people in the commercial sector who have lobbyists who are speaking to members of Congress on a daily basis about these things. Um, and they see it as uh, intellectual property as it stimulates the economy. And so they have a very strong relationship with members of Congress about these issues. We have to point out that there are other cultural, intellectual issues that have long-term effects for society and we just have to be heard. So anything any of you can do about that is really important. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and being just down the road from Hollywood, literally, um, we can I can see how that, for example, Adam Schiff is a congressman who I very much admire his point of view in a lot of things, but he's also an uh, extremely strong voice for the, the, the motion picture and television industry in terms of protecting their rights because there's right. such an important force. And this is a his, special his issue in California where uh, uh, the, all of the startups and all of the entertainment industry, industries have very different perspectives on some of these issues, and um, they're valid. I, I don't mean to say they aren't, but uh, there are other valid issues too. We just have to remind people that um, we lose something if we don't uh, think about the long term, and that's what libraries do really well. They think about how Society is going to fare over time and, and what we need to do to make sure that the next generation has access to at least as much as we do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Deanna, that, your answer was wide ranging enough to sketch out an entire seminar on copyright and education. <laughs> Um, you move from the 1976 copyright law to the, the long the long durée aspect. Is I'm um, my fingers are going to fall off taking notes on this. Um, 
We have another question from uh, another participant who just has to leave, so I'm going to read this out loud. This is from Stephen Bell, um, and he asks, in higher ed, over the next 10 years, develop more personalized services that target services delivered to student and faculty. Whoops. Um, they'll be interested in how AI can be leveraged to do that. What do you think about that? Mm, that's a good read? question. Um, maybe you can help me with that, Brian. You probably know more about uh, how artificial intelligence can be used. I, my, my kind of primitive understanding is that um, there, are, there are lots of things that we can do that would give automatic, quick answers for kind of routine things that come up from, from our users. Um, and I, I, I haven't really thought about this very much, but I suspect there are lots of things that we could do to harness technology to deliver services any time people want them rather than when we just happen to be around. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I've, I've uh, been involved in recently that begin to hint at this. Um, I'm working right now on a case study of the University of Maryland University College. This is part of my <laughs> educational transformation of responsibility at Ithaca SNR. And um, I just finished the interviews at UMUC. It's a, it's a completely independent part of the University of Maryland system, but it's a, an organization that focuses exclusively on adult learners. It's mostly an online program. And um, the new president there, relatively new president there, um, came from the Office of Institutional Assessment. And so he has a very strong desire to make decisions based on data. And one of the first things he learned is that, uh, because it's an international program, they, they're offering courses on military bases around the world and online courses to Maryland citizens and, and others in the country. So that it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are students who need help of some kind. So they went to um, a, a corporation to find a help desk person who had that 24-7 mentality. And mm. they mm. automated as many answers to routine questions as possible. But they also have a 24-7 help desk with live people. So the first, first uh, point of entry is, you know, is, is this a routine question? Can we answer it in an automated fashion? Then it goes to a help desk person. And they have invested so much in that, but they've included questions about financial aid, questions about courses, questions about technology, questions about the resources needed for the course, and such things as, you know, how can I find a mentor in my area uh, to help me become the professional I want to become? You know, it's, it's the full range of things. And they, they took all of those separate activities and they have combined them into one office and everyone's been cross-trained so that whenever there is a question from anywhere in the world, it's answered immediately and it's a one-stop answer. And it seems to me that in, those, in the same way uh, libraries and other support units on, on our campuses could begin to think about you know, what are the common questions we get and how might we automate those and then have a backup service that's more personalized uh, for the particular questions. And you know, I, I don't know exactly how that might work, but it seemed I was very impressed with what I saw at UMUC. And with once you start focusing on the needs of the user rather than what we've been trained to do and how we'd like to deliver it, you know, those, those become very different 
questions and we we establish different kinds of services. That's a very powerful statement. I wonder if we're going to read that statement over the door of the next information schools. I mean, once we focus on the needs of the users. Um, I, I've got a couple of thoughts about this. Uh, I think we're seeing some progress in K-12 and in a few other countries. Um, but I, I would really like to, to turn this over to participants. I'd like to hear what you guys think. Uh, we've covered, by we, I mean Deanda has outlined a series of powerful trends uh, for the future of libraries. Uh, starting with the discussion of the possibility of increased mergers or synthesis of services and entities, um, the growing need for decentralized, uh, distributed uh, preservation, uh, some of the new services that libraries can offer faculty, including data, geospatial services, uh, and the new aspect of uh, faculty turning to librarians to help students' ability to find information resources. Now we also have the possibility of, on the one hand, Libraries doing more uh, on copyright and the possibility of libraries working with AIs to better personalize student services. I'd like you to ask, take yourself three minutes, five minutes, and see which of these trends for you seems most influential for libraries going forward. And I mean both public libraries, academic libraries, special collection libraries, corporate libraries. Which of these trends do you think is most powerful? Now, if you haven't done this before, uh, this mingling that we do, and the way it works is Deanna and I both get off the stage and we join you down on the bottom. And this is just like a big seminar room or just like a big auditorium. You get to find somebody, turn to them, say hello, introduce yourself. Now, if they don't want to talk to you, that's okay. Click on somebody else who does. Um, if you're a little surprised, I just want to give you a little warning that some total stranger, maybe with a beard, will show up and say, hello, what do you think about future trends of libraries? Um, but please turn to your neighbor and talk about these trends. We've got five minutes. We'll come back and share what we've learned. Okay, Shindig, folks, if you can boot us off stage, we can start talking to folks. Well, welcome back, everybody, after a very energetic mingling. It's very good to see people clumping together in twos and threes and sharing their thoughts. I really appreciate that. That's always, for me, an exciting part of it. Um, I really like having a, a forum that's mostly based on conversations uh, and less on PowerPoint. Uh, Deanna, um, all kinds of ideas came up in, in the um, conversations I walked into. Uh, let me just mention one. Uh, this is from uh, Anne Roselle uh, out in Phoenix. And she wondered, what trends you're seeing in the transformation of library physical spaces? Well, it, that um, is one of the most interesting trends, and uh, I think you're quite right in pointing to it. Um, so many institutions are now thinking about the materials they should move off-site or deaccession, to use our favorite library term, um, because they realize that more space is needed for student collaboration, of different kinds of spaces that students need. Coffee shops <laughs> are also an important part. Um, and, and adding technology so that different, uh, different pieces of technology can be installed in the library for both faculty and student use. So uh, it raises many interesting questions about uh, what do we do with all of these materials that we have on our shelves that people aren't consulting? How do we move those without losing them uh, so that we can do more creative yes. things with the physical space? Um, I'm very interested in some of the collaborative efforts that are underway uh, to develop print repositories so that those materials will be available for anyone who does need them, even though they're infrequently used, and still um, using space in a different way. Um, a number of libraries are bringing writing centers, teaching and learning centers, uh, technology help centers, you know, all, all kinds of things that provide more immediate services for our users. And so I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, also, teaching spaces are becoming an important part of libraries so that 
faculty can bring their students into the physical library and introduce them to some of the services that students may not know so much about and have immediate access to the materials that they're trying to teach their students uh, to use. And so I think there are many opportunities to think about space as a way to forge that connection between faculty and librarians, between students and librarians and, and all three. Um, but it's a really good point uh, to think about the use of space. It's a terrific question and, um, and a great answer, Dana. What did you uh, What did you run into in your conversations just now? What other topics came up for you? What other trends? I, I had a, a, a nice uh, set of comments and suggestions from Mark Wilson about uh, metadata standards, and I wasn't terribly helpful to him. I, I referred him to metadata specialists in the Library of Congress who are working really hard on these issues, but um, also uh, his interest in Omeka as a preservation technology. So that that was a good conversation we had. Well, <clears throat> and Omeka is another one of those uh, open source built by academics for academics tools. That's very exciting. Uh, that may go back to our previous our previous conversation about uh, librarians uh, producing uh, technology, uh, making tools for people. Yes. We had a, a, another question that came up, um, which uh, came up in discussion among two or three different people. I'm going to try and paraphrase it. And, and friends, if, if I mangle this, please uh, let us know either through the uh, raise hand or the ask or the chat. Um, it's a kind of sociological question. The question is, are we seeing uh, two different types of librarians, two different groups? Uh, one group of librarians that's really excited about change and about innovation and technological progress and likes to embrace them. And then the others that say, enough, we've, we've done enough. We have a lot of, of users that we can serve through our old traditional patterns. Uh, we do a lot with books and other physical media. Um, and you know we're going we're going too far with too much technology. Are, are you seeing this kind of sociological split in the librarian profession? And, and if so, how does that how does that fall out over the next five to ten years? Well, it, it's oh, it's a, a very interesting observation. I think it's right. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, for um, for many of us, including me, um, to talk about the new, creative, energetic, wonderful librarian who's doing all these new things um, and, and forgetting that, you know, we have users who have all kinds of needs. Um, one, of, one of the remarkable qualities of libraries is that um, we have resources to help people with almost anything. And we also have skills resident in the library that are really useful to different groups at different times for different purposes. What I hope we can do as a profession is embrace the best of all of us because all of those skills are needed. And um, it's really important to me that we think about um, moving into the future by bringing the best of what we've done and the best of what we can be together into a single organization where we give credit for everything. Um, that's easier said than done. And most of us mm. are working in organizations have leaders with particular uh, priorities and particular enthusiasms, and uh, we, we may or may not fit personally in, into those schemes. And yet, it's, uh, I, I just think it's important to think about, sorry, my phone's going off. I, let me turn that off. Um, it's really oh, important to technology. think about uh, intergenerational library services 
we have faculty of all ages and all technological uh, intelligences <laughs> that we we need to. Mm. to um, if we all start with what do we need to do to meet the needs of our users? I keep going back to this. If we look through that lens, then what does that mean we personally need to do? And are there are there skills we need to add to our existing skill set? Do we need to partner with, you know, do I need to partner with younger librarians who have different skills than I have? in order to deliver those services that we need to deliver. So yes, I think there, but I hope we can get beyond trying to categorize people and say, you know, here, these are the librarians who are doing good things and these are the librarians who are doing bad things or holding us back. Rather, we have this array of skills and we can use these for this purpose and those for that purpose. And as an institution or as a group, we are providing resources that really matter to all of our users. And that's, uh, that may be my optimistic hope for all of us, but I, I think that's really important. What a uh, great question. And uh, Deanna, what, a, what an ecumenical and very positive answer. Um, uh, just this triggered a memory for me of the classic science fiction film, Tron where the hero is known as he who fights for the users. Oh, and I like that. It seems to me like your librarian is Trump, <laughs> yeah. who is able to just, you know, um, because that's, uh, I, again, this, you've said this several times, where, where if you rethink library services, not in terms of, of, of push, of, you know, we have these great things, show them at people, but look at the users and see what they need and what they want and how you can address them. Um, right. I think that's, that's, that's very powerful. Um, friends, I, I have I have one more question that I'd like to ask. Um, and while I'm phrasing that question, we have time for one more question from the rest of you guys. So please click the raise hand or the ask button if you've got one to add. Because we're coming wickedly close to the end of the hour. Do you know the question I have it goes back to that great report about faculty attitudes? And you point out that amazing discovery about faculty increasingly wanting librarian help in working with students to improve their information literacy skills. The question I had was, what do you think happened in the world for that to change? Do you think, for example, that students have to some extent been de-skilled? Uh, do you think that this reflects a rising generation of faculty, on the other hand, who have more expectations about digital work? I mean, those are just my two, yeah. you know, Big guesses. What, what do you think? What happened? This is an interesting. I wish I knew the answer. I, I honestly don't know the answer. Uh, one of the things that that I worry about a little is uh, there's a tendency. I notice it in myself, and I notice it in my colleagues. As we get older, we're more likely. Hmm. To think that the younger folks don't have the skills they need. Um, that's what my parents thought about me when, <laughs> when I was young. Mm. Uh, and, and I, you know, there's just a tendency to do that. I, we think uh, because people don't know how to diagram sentences, somehow they're not fully literate or th those kinds of things. Um, and then you stop and ask yourself, you know, am I really a better person because I know how to diagram a sentence? Well, probably not. Um, I think a, a better question might be what skills, what specific skills uh, do we see lacking in our students? I mean, what are the specific things that we think they need help with? And begin to identify those skills and talking with librarians about what those skills are and then together figuring out what, what do we do about those. Um, I worry that it's too easy to say students don't, you know, are underprepared or students don't have the same kind of education preparation that that we think they should have. Um, 
in order to make progress, we're going to have to be really specific about what, what those things are. And I don't know why faculty are seeing that as a bigger problem now than they were. It's, we would have to do some qualitative research to figure that out, and maybe that's something we should be doing to try to understand that issue better. I think so. I think that that's a really good uh, good point. Uh, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask people about that in my travels and see what people say, because I think that's a very subtle point um, and, uh, and worth addressing. We, we have videos. one question that came up. I see what I can find. Uh, we have one question from Ohio. Uh, this is Joe Murphy, a uh, great free to transform uh, participant, who says, we've talked about national, local, and personal activities. Is that just productive tension, or are there values models to cut across? Hmm. Yeah. Nice question, Joe. I like it. Um, well, there certainly are tensions. I, there have to be ways, though, to cut across. I mean, if we're going to make real progress, we have to align personal, local, national interests. And again, uh, this is where specificity really helps. And what are the what are the big goals we're trying to achieve? Um, what is my institution doing to try to advance us in that particular area? And then what am I doing uh, as an individual to make sure that um, I'm also doing my part? And those are probably discussions that need to go on at the personal institutional level and then at the institutional, national, or even regional level. Um, and I, I don't know that we have good ways of doing it. One of the things I'd love to see more of, and Brian, I think you're really helping so much with conversations by creating these uh, technological platforms that allow us to talk to each other. Think about the number of conferences we go to where we're just talked at. Um, and there, there must be time uh -huh. in these conferences that we all attend where there is at least facilitated discussion that feeds into something larger. I think we're all frustrated by small groups that don't really have any anything to do except talk to each other. But imagine all the time we're spending together where there could be uh -huh. um, you know, a funnel to a, a bigger conversation, or we could begin to identify things that each of us could do individually or organizationally to help advance a particular agenda. Um, I just think we can be more creative in how we use our time together when we are in face-to-face -face situations. I agree. I agree very much, and I really appreciate the, uh, the shout-out. Um, I passionately believe this, that like with unconferences or, or uh, open space meetings, I love this ability to work with people, which is a terrible note to end on because now I have to kick you off because uh, I have to put on slides to show people what's happening next. Um, right. I, I'm so glad you came, Deanna. Thank, Thank you very, you so much. very much. I really appreciate uh, it. We're going to have to come back to you, I think. It's been um, fun, and, Brian. Thank you. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Um, and thank you, Michael, for the kind words. Um, we're at the end of the hour, um, so I, I need to mention that next week, uh, next Thursday at this time, our next guest is someone who's going to dive deeply with us into technology. This is my friend Phil Long, who's currently the Chief Innovation Officer and Associate Vice President, Provost at the University of Texas, Austin, where he's also VP of the Society of Learning. He's an honorary professor of analytics and knowledge at the University of Queensland, he used to work in a little school called MIT. Uh, Phil is a very, very deep and advanced thinker about issues ranging from blockchain to analytics. We're really going to push the envelope with what happens to data, data ownership, 
So these are themes that we've touched on before in the future transform. Um, I strongly recommend coming uh, next week with questions about where we can go with technology. You can see a few links there. Uh, the About Me link will tell you more about Phil's background. But the bottom of three links uh, are about projects and ideas that he wants us to pay attention to. Uh, the first is an interesting discussion about ethics and privacy with data. And the second is about a new kind of micro master's program coming out of MIT. I think you'll find those very good discussion bits to get us thinking about technology. So um, again, let me thank you all uh, for participating, for having terrific questions and comments, which we've all really enjoyed, benefited from. Um, hey, next slide for a sec, please. I'll just bring this up. If you'd like to find out more um, about what we're doing, what we're talking about, let me just dwell on this slide for a sec. Uh, first, again, the FTTE site will tell you more about the Future Trends Report. Um, and I'm saying this for t one really particularly selfish reason, is because many readers of FTTE send me stories and suggestions and feedback. So the more people who read it, the more people who subscribe, the smarter and richer it gets. So we'd love to hear more from you. And then shindig.com, uh, where you can learn more about this technology platform. Uh, but also, we've spoken about open learning and open education resources in the past. Um, the image that I've been using uh, is one that was published under a Creative Commons license. Remember, we had uh, Casey Green, uh, Cable Green talking about that. So I just want to make sure that you saw that I have the uh, creator of this image and a URL to where you can find the image yourself up here. So we're kind of you know walking the talk for open. Um, I've got a few minutes if you guys would like to hang out and speak, but let me just conclude this session. Uh, right now, thank you again. Thanks to Deanna for so much contribution. Thanks to you participants. And thank you to the Shindig people for all their great behind the scenes work making all this happen on stage. Um, thanks again. And let's talk if you'd like to. In fact, Shindig folks, can you kick me off the stage so I can mingle with people? <laughs>